uh, I now call upon the next uh, speaker and chairman, Mr. Wona. And uh, our guest speaker, Mr. Togaritis. Thank you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker, I think uh, there was the, when the council sat down, they decided to give you the most complex one. Spent all night trying to pronounce it. <laughs> Our next speaker is Olabode Olajumoke. <laughs> <laughs> From now on, called Bode. <laughs> so he's a health actuary from QED Consulting. His background is in pensions and now he's in health, the health industry. So he's worked with various uh, institutions ranging from the US, the UK, Sub Saharan Africa, including, including Zimbabwe. With a career, I think, that's spanning over 19 years. So he's vastly experienced in this. So. I think it would be very worthwhile for us to be able to listen to this. His topic is on governance in the South African medical scheme context. And he, so he, he basically explains a bit about the governance in, in South Africa and what are the implications for Zimbabwe, as well as what are the implications for Zimbabwe and actuaries. Got it? Let me first give a disclaimer that I'm just 19 years in Cleveland as a toddler. So <laughs> I don't want to guess my age or anything like that. So thanks so much. But uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I just wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about medical skin government in South Africa and how that has an implication for the market here as well. Uh, so I'll touch upon King 3, which is uh, governance based on uh, directors from uh, you know, Southern Africa, it's not actually a required regulation, but it was a self regulation on their part. And then sort of easing into the Medical Scheme Act, and then going to the duties of the trustees as a result of the Medical Scheme Act itself. Then practical considerations in terms of what went wrong and how, um, what the impact of that was. And then the implication for this market, as well as actuaries, what do we do to uh, affect some kind of um, impact in the market. So moving right along, uh, King 3, like I said, it's an institute it's with our, it's, uh, formed by the Institute of Directors in Southern Africa. Basically, these are directors for uh, top J, uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange companies. They came together and they decided to form some kind of a government government committee and decided that King 3 was a way to have a self-regulation on the uh, corporate government. So that includes things like social responsibility, uh, uh, the nomination of the board members, what are the criteria, the education criteria, etc. And also the financial reporting, you know, we have seen situations where banks have gone under in the US and things like that, simply because uh, the corporate government was not uh, up to scratch. So this was something that uh, this uh, King 3 Commission uh, decided to bring together. And uh, most, uh, most uh, companies actually um, are required by their own customer, uh, by their own internal uh, operations to comply with King 3. And they have a governance and a comp uh, compliance officer in their companies to do so. So then moving that into the medical scheme environment, uh, in 1998, the Medical Scheme Act was formed and that took uh, some of the tenants of the uh, King 3, or well, King 1 at the time but uh, it emerged and merged it into the uh, <coughs> Medical Scheme Act. So the Medical Scheme Act, in regards to governments, decided to break it up into risk management, board representation, code of conduct, duties, information, etc. But uh, just looking at this, you see that some of the aspects of King 3 were actually directly uh, related to this. So we're talking about reporting, financial reporting of medical schemes in terms of their loss ratios, their um, profitability, their solvency. All that was uh, something that was required by the Medical Scheme Act. Now, the Medical Scheme Act is um, regulated by the Council for Medical Scheme, which reports to the, to the uh, uh, Minister of uh, Health in, in, uh, in South Africa. So, uh, moving along, we have um, board representation, which requires that 50% of your, of your board, of your board of trustees, must be elected by members of the, uh, of the organization. So, that is uh, a very key point there because they need to make sure that members are 
have a say in what's going on in the operations of the company. And then uh, independence uh, administrators, you know, that's also actuaries or whoever is actually a person administration for the scheme must be independent so they cannot be trustees, for instance. They have to uh, have that separate uh, operation. Then information, you know, this is uh, one that was uh, key but not uh, in, in, included in King 3. It's very important, I believe we're going to talk about TCF later, but uh, the protection of private, private information is a very important act that's uh, separating in South Africa now. And that's based on disclosure of information. So how much of a patient's information can you disclose? Right. I hope you can hear me at the back. Okay. So how much of your personal information can you disclose? How much of the, um, how much, uh, how much uh, background can you give to, uh, to the external parties, etc.? Those are things that were, that are concerned, that the Council for Medical Scheme decided to put on that ambit in terms of uh, governance and the cooperation. Uh, of course, communication with members, and we'll touch upon that later, but it's very key. It's important to ensure that members know what they are paying for and what they're buying. They want to know that the benefits that they're getting is, is absolutely uh, you know, comprehensive and well understood. And that, that, that's always been a challenge with some of the bigger medical schemes like Discovery that has all these medical savings plans, etc. Most people find them complicated, but uh, it's important for Discovery and other medical schemes to actually go on road shows to ensure that members fully understand exactly what it is they are bargaining for. Financial, we'll touch upon it as well. Asset allocations, I believe um, the Council for Medical Schemes decided that you cannot invest more than 25% in, say, equity, for instance. You cannot invest more than uh, 15 or 25% in uh, international uh, uh, bonds, etc. So there's some regulatory restrictions on the assets that you can um, actually uh, invest in. And solvency, uh, there's a requirement that 25% of your contributions must be, uh, at least 25% must be reserved as your, for, for, must be reserved for, for ensuring the operation of the company. And then each, uh, the, 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 there's a requirement that uh, professional ability <coughs> cover must be obtained by the medical scheme. <coughs> now, uh, specifically on the duties of the trustees, because the, uh, the Medical Scheme Act actually honed in on the trustees because they are the real custodians of the medical scheme. They are the ones in charge of uh, ensuring that everybody, the members, are uh, in, good, uh, in, in good stead with the scheme. So financial soundness, very important. You know, sustainability of the benefit options. So for example, you might have five options within your medical plan. Each one of them must be self-sustained. Now that's not, <coughs> and I'll be honest with you, that's not, that is a challenge <laughs> because not all medical schemes can actually do that. But that is one of the guidelines for uh, sustainability. Affordability in the market, you know, you have low-income medical schemes and you have a high-income scheme, but it's, uh, again, a challenge in the market, but it's one of the things that the Council for Medical Schemes put together. Product design, we'll touch on a few of that later, but uh, there's some things called uh, prescribed minimum benefits, which is a, basically a list of chronic diseases that must be covered by all medical plan. So you get it, regardless of whether it's a low income or a you know, comprehensive plan, you must include those chronic diseases. Okay. Record keeping in case of litigation or just you know just to have a records to put, so you can fall back on. Those are important as well. Administration, you must have a service level agreement with your administrators, actuaries, um, plan administrators, etc. in order to ensure that you have full compliance with, with uh, the market. Effective communication is also important to the political scheme as well. Now, um, these practical considerations are based on things that we've seen, you know, without naming medical schemes themselves that have gone through this. What we've done is we've collated some of the issues that we've experienced or that we've seen in the last year or two and uh, put it into this uh, situation. So, the issues we saw were like poor record keeping, lack of professional inputs, lack of financial focus, no training of the trustees, etc., poor leadership. Now, what impact did that have on the medical scheme? Well, they weren't able, you know, pricing was an issue. Now we can't price adequately. There was no direction. You have a situation where trustees decide to maybe introduce some plans without any actuarial or 
uh, administrative guidelines. So there was just people just doing what they want to do, but not really uh, fully understanding what they what they're trying to do. So that lack of communication led to just um, out of scope uh, running out of uh, ideas entirely. And the likely income of that was well, some of them went into curatorship, and some were liquidated or merged into other big medical schemes. And of course. You know, I don't know if some of you have been following FIFA lately, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's a negative impact on your particular organization if there's one scandal or one, you know, report everybody's aware that you haven't been paying your providers or you just have people taking hundred thousand dollars and uh, taking it as personal income from the medical scheme, things like that. So in South Africa, some of the current controversies, and I, and I put these controversies out there because I want us to say, let's not just take the South African template and plant it in Zimbabwe. Let's borrow some of the positive effects of the South African uh, environment and use it uh, effectively. And if there are some cases where there's been controversial issues, let's see how we can do it here to ensure that we don't have this kind of issues. The big one right now is this issue of uh, dedication. I don't know if you've heard of it. I don't know if you have this issue, but simply it means that you have a medical schemes which are operated by the Council for Medical Schemes. They basically pay for every opportunity you go to the hospital, they will pay for those expenses. They will pay the providers directly. That's, what it, that's how a medical operation works. But in health insurance, you go to the hospital and you pay a cash. You basically pay cash, you, the individual, you pay cash for that particular operation. So now there's a bit of a conflict where they're saying, well, the medical schemes are paying the providers, but the health insurers are paying you. So that's, so they're, and they're regulated under two different groups. The health insurance is regulated under long-term care, or long-term and short-term <coughs> act. And that's, uh, yeah, that's administered by the FSB, Financial Service Report, which reports to the Ministry of Finance. I don't know if some of you are familiar. Even here, we're having issues with IPEC and, uh, and, um, and the um, Ministry of Health. IPEC wants health insurance to be a part of uh, All medical health insurance should be run by IPEC. But the uh, Ministry of Health says, no, no, no. Anything health is run by health. So we're having the same issues. You know, it's almost like deja vu for me hearing this. So, so what we need to do is try and hold back a little bit and see how is South Africa dealing with this issue? The answer is they're still dealing with it. <laughs> okay. And um, some other controversies, I mentioned earlier that you need to have prescribed minimum benefits. Now, those prescribed minimum benefits are the most, I mean, chronic events, you know, they're high cost and low, I mean, they're high severity and maybe low um, frequency, but they're very high cost uh, events. Now, the question is, how can we, as a medical scheme, be forced to have this when you want us to be self-sustainable, you want us to be solvent? You know, so it's a bit of a dicey issue. So it's a controversy and there's a lot of debates around it in terms of what are we going to do to get it right. There's a solvency requirement of 25% of contributions. That's it. No um, risk analysis, there's no there's, you know, SAM or Solvency 2 analysis on risk. It's just 25% of contributions. So if I have that kind of money as a small company, I'm set. And most of the small medical schemes usually have a good uh, solvency level. But Discovery, which is one of the biggest medical schemes in South Africa, is hovering around 23, 25. You know, so technically speaking, they are insolvent. But we all know Discovery is one of the biggest schemes and they're operating at a good margin. Now, broker commissions, yeah, well, yeah, I don't, how many brokers in here? One. Oh. You're the chosen few, that's okay. Um, in South Africa, there's a debate as to how to um, eliminate uh, broker commissions. Now, the controversy there is that brokers feel that they're offering some services to the medical scheme members through education, communication, etc., wellness days and all that. So if you eliminate their, um, their uh, possibilities, then you're not really doing well by the, comp by the members. And that contravenes some of the medical scheme act. So, so it's a very interesting situation. Efficiency discounts, that basically what's happened there is there's some discounted network plans. Some of them are approved by the medical scheme, some are not approved. So the question is, what is the criteria for approving? <coughs> Transfer of risks. 
Now, this is a key one as well. I don't know if many people know what capitation is. Capitation is a fixed payment to providers, regardless of whether the member goes to the hospital or not. So essentially, the provider gets an income. But in return, whether the member goes to the hospital or not, they get to carry the risk. According to the Medical Scheme Act, uh, transfer of risk is not allowed. So the question is, why do you allow capitation, but you don't allow transfer of risk? So we, we got a bit of a double speak here. So one, I, I believe the theme you're hearing here is that there's a lot of double speak in terms of what's legislated and what's allowed, and the controversy around that. In terms of late joiner penalties, I'll uh, talk about that. It basically says, if you are a member who is eligible to be in a medical scheme, and you chose not to be in a medical scheme, and then maybe sometime later you want to be in a medical scheme, you will pay your premium plus additional load, and that will follow you for life. So on the one hand, medical scheme act says you must not restrict anybody from joining medical scheme. But some people feel this penalty, this late penalty thing, is a way of restricting members from joining medical scheme. Another mm -hmm. level speak. Low income options, some people can, again, it's a, it's a case of how do you uh, decide that a low income option can be offered when we know that it's not sustainable? And of course, bargaining council uh, benefits. Why, how is it offered? Why is it offered? Who is in charge? How, how do you decide? How do you approve one and you don't approve another? So again, issues uh, to consider. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, it's all the, there have been cases where the Council for Medical Scheme and the uh, FSB, Financial Services Board, are working together to try and solve some of the issues, particularly this um, uh, demarcation issue that I mentioned earlier. It's a, it's, a, it's a massive issue. And there's been some headways. There's been cases where some gap cover benefits, which basically covers the gap between medical scheme, um, between medical scheme options, where a member gets to pay the, the difference. That difference is covered under gap cover, which is offered by health insurance. So now those covers are OK. But uh, in some cases, there's been uh, contentious issues with that too. Now, the enforcement of the Medical Services Act, which is the act here in, in uh, Zimbabwe, it needs to be enforced, just like the uh, Medical Scheme Act in South Africa is being enforced. I think um, in the, some of the work I've done here, you find that the medical schemes don't price according to the fundamentals. They say, okay, the medical plan A is offering $100, I'm gonna offer $95. Even though, your, even though the benefit may well be richer than the one that's hundred dollars, so there's no government. There's you know, and even if the, even if the Medical Services Act doesn't put a hammer on you, you as an organisation must take it upon yourself to ensure that you're doing the right thing by your members. Because the effect of that is, if you don't price for them mentally, you have losses. If you cannot pay your providers, you have negative impact on your entire operations. You know, so we've seen a bit of that, and we're really working with some of the medical schemes here to really look at that. And we're also working with the regulators to sell as well to try and give us some guidance on that. Um, so a law is as good as its compliance and enforcement. That goes for anything, really. You know, if you have laws on the books and there's no ways of, I mean, if you have traffic lights and no one obeys it, then it's just as good as uh, nothing. So again, not all medical schemes comply with King 3. Uh, because it's not required, you know, it's one of those uh, op uh, optional things. But it is something that most, but it's one of those things that differentiates one medical scheme from another. They can say, listen, we comply with King 3, so we'll work with us, you know, that kind of thing. So it's a good, uh, it's a good um, corporate uh, uh, advantage, if you like. <coughs> So strict financial controls are required. We talked about the pricing earlier. We talked about uh, trustees needing to be more in, uh, in hands-on in terms of how the medical scheme works. They need to really scrutinize the financials. They must really ensure that uh, members are being treated fairly. They must make sure that the providers are being paid. And they must make sure that they understand the workings of the scheme at all. I mean, I mentioned earlier that the trustees must be from diverse background. So you might have somebody who's a well person in finance, HR, medical, economics, actuarial, or whatever. There must be a, a wide range of people in the medical scheme trustees so that when you scrutinize some issues on the financial, you have the different experiences coming into play. 
and the control of tariffs and enforcing payment standards is very, is very <coughs> crucial. Even in South Africa, we haven't got this right in terms of uh, national tariffs. You know, most people, you know, we set national tariffs at one point and, you know, it was uh, scrapped after a while. Here we still have what you call Air Force tariffs. Air Force is the Association of Health Funders of Zimbabwe. They've set a list of tariffs for, uh, for providers. But the controversy there is that some providers who are more experienced will say, why am I being charged? Why am I being given the same tariff as a guy who's got two years of experience? That's a very legitimate uh, issue. How, why should the doctor in Mutare be getting the same tariff as the doctor in Harare? You know, it's a, again, you know, the practice and the, the practice differences should ensure that there should be some uh, variation there. So that's uh, an opportunity for actuaries to work on that. On that side. So uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> compliance with uh, either the Medical Scheme Act or Committee, et cetera, these are what we call the onboard uh, requirements or steps that the trustee must, must take to ensure compliance uh, with uh, the Medical Schemes Act, et cetera. You know, they must acknowledge the principle of godness. They basically must scrutinize the Medical Scheme Act and understand exactly what it's, uh, what it's all about. And then adopt the principles of King 3. I mean, it's not required, but it's one of those things that differentiate yourself. Okay. And then ensure that the board is represented at all levels. Like I mentioned, different uh, backgrounds as much as possible. Empower the board. Now, this is another key, option, uh, key issue. We've seen situations where the uh, chairman or chair lady is always the uh, boss, you know, they make themselves known as the boss. And because of that, you have despondencies from the rest of the trustee, they just don't care. <laughs> and if they don't care, they don't have any, uh, any, any feeling for the scheme, then guess what's gonna happen? Nobody's gonna be fully compliant and then the scheme goes into uh, serious problems. So they must focus on reporting and understanding what the issues are around reporting for the, for the medical system itself and ensure that government's, uh, government's principles are always at the back of their mind when they are making decisions on the other Now, is there, any, is there anyone practicing health actuarial work in Zimbabwe? Am I the only one? Or two? Again, we're the chosen few, so <laughs> count yourself <laughs> lucky. I, I probably have caused some uh, dissonance against some of the rest of the people in the room, but that's okay. Um, now, the implication for actuaries here, basically these are the opportunities in this market for actuaries to, uh, to explore in terms of uh, um, assisting medical plans, self-insurance plans, hospitals, whatever. So, accurate pricing for medical plans, that's very key. I mean, it's, it's part of the Medical Services Act, but there's no requirement for an actuary to be the one doing this work. But one thing that's very important and I'm very happy to hear in this market is a lot of the medical schemes rec rec uh, they recognize the need for actuarial input into their work. So that's fantastic. You know, so when we have more qualified Zimbabwean actuaries, then they can do a lot of this work as well. Financial reporting and risk management, very key. You know, scrutinizing the financial reports, project, uh, uh, system of projections, IBNRs, and, uh, and uh, setting insolvency reserves, etc. Advice on solvency, benefit design. Now, we don't have the issue of prescribed minimum benefits here, but I get a feeling we're going to start hearing some things like minimum benefits requirements. Those are things that we we'll need to assist um, some of the medical plans on as well. Of course, uh, we must also remain independent. We must declare our conflict of interest. We can't be trustees in a, in a medical plan. If somebody invites you to be a trustee, according to the I'm sure the actual society of Zimbabwe, ASA, Society of Actors, etc. It's also one of those government issues within our area. <coughs> there was whistleblowing discussions, I think, with David uh, earlier on. And um, again, it is uh, it's not a, it's not required by the Medical, uh, Medical Services Act, but it is required by our own personal kind of conduct as well as the actuarial society. So if there's any uh, FIFA-like issues going on, it's uh, important for us to raise a flag and, uh, and uh, whistleblow, and you will be protected according to the law. The law actually protects you in South Africa uh, on whistleblowing uh, issues as well. So I think that's um, my main uh, topic, but I think the important thing I wanted to leave everybody here with today is that self-regulation is as important as actual regulation. You know, in a market like this where 
there's a little self regulate uh, there's a little uh, regulation around actuarial practice. I think it creates an opportunity for us because we have our we already have our own professional code of conduct, which the um, regulators can tap into. So the King Three Commission, I brought it into this discussion because it was an example of how self regulation can enable the regulators to tap into something rather than come up with a set of regulations which they may not be, uh, since they're not privy to the industry, they might just come up with something that's in their own best interest, but not in the best interest of the industry. So it's important for us to keep that in mind as we do our work uh, anywhere in the world. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll take some questions. Thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to find out, uh, I saw at some point you pointed out to PMD, the uh, prescribed the minimum benefits. Right. So you talked about 272, the says, yeah. to the same point. So my question would be, is that reviewed normally? Is it really reviewed? Because I'm supposing that maybe the list is, is, mm. is time progresses might not necessarily be applicable. Uh, yeah, for example, no. the dollar just came recently. I'm not mm. sure if it is part of those part of that. Uh, that's a good question. They do. I mean, the question was: uh, do, Are these reviewed every every year in terms of the post, um, prescribed minimum benefits? And the answer is yes. There are different codes that uh, they um, that they look at. And uh, I don't I don't actually don't know if it's every year, but I know periodically they are reviewed, you know, to ensure that it's up to date. So with Ebola, for example, um, I'm not quite sure if that's uh, actually included yet. But uh, <coughs> you know, there are some you know. There are some codes that are being added, and there's some that are being deleted as well, you know, to keep up with the uh, medical practices. Mm -hmm. from a regulator perspective in terms of solvency, etc. And the second question was, how does uh, prescribed minimum benefits affect pricing? Uh, let me start with the second one. Obviously, you have to, um, you know, you have to include them. You'll find situations where some medical schemes have a very good risk of members, whereby the prevalence of uh, um, prescribed minimum benefits are not very high. So they'll look at their claims experiences and uh, use that to engage what types of pricing that they have. The important thing is um, uh, it's very it's very risky, but uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's it's including pricing. Not that all the medical schemes don't have a prescribed. Uh, they don't have a particular fixed pricing on each particular benefit. But <coughs> it's something that is actually you know solvency of uh, the group, especially the smaller medical schemes. It actually forced them to merge with uh, some of the bigger medical schemes because they couldn't uh, afford. Uh, some of the prescribing benefits, and I, and I think that's what drove some of the um, some of the discussions around why should we be, uh, have, have why should we have to have prescribing on benefits when we can't afford to actually uh, um, to, uh, to actually price them. And the second question on um, medical scheme, um, well, like I said, in terms of solvency, the Medical Scheme Act requires you to hold 25% of your contribution, i.e., your premiums. 
as uh, accumulated reserves. So those reserves must be set in place for the operations of the scheme. That is under the uh, medical scheme that. Now, health insurance falls under the long-term act and the short-term act as well. So whatever sovereignty requirements there is exactly what is required. So in terms of, I think we're moving towards uh, SAM, in South Africa, sovereignty as assessment. We're moving towards that in South Africa. So health insurance will fall under that mandate once, uh, once that falls into place. Did I answer the question? <coughs> Thank you for that. Uh, I've seen the things that we The medical institutes, the tendency of changing the way the, the, way the universe benefits. Mm -hmm. So if you go today, they will pay 100% of certain drugs, whatever, mm -hmm. and then go back next year. And then you're told, no, you no longer pay 100%. They will change the benefits. My question is, from a trading customer's faith, mm -hmm. what sort of uh, powers do trading companies have to change the terms and conditions in which they sold uh, you know, the medical cover to, to, to do an interview? Yeah. And then the change is made up. And what are the minimum communication requirements during the currency of the company? The medical is the insurance. Are you speaking from South Africa or here? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from South but I also want to know what the practice is. Well, the practice in South Africa is obviously your premium will be locked in for the year. But we do have interim reviews. You know, and some of the smaller plans, they do have interim premium hikes. And that covers any kind of renegotiation they have with providers. But that has to be communicated up front. So you can't just really nearly come in and increase your premiums without communicating to members. Obviously, give them a chance to uh, to respond to it, and then uh, then then you implement it. So it, it is uh, it is one of those things that you have to. Again, it, 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 to me, I think it contravenes that kind of relationship because you already told me this is the premium I'm going to be locked in for the year, and I've already budgeted that in my head. Now you're telling me media that I might be going to be interest, especially if I'm a healthy person. So you're going to have a bit of a controversy, and that's why the council requires that time frame for, for you to uh, <coughs> communicate to the members. And of course, the council has to approve it. It's about changing. Yeah, they have to. Well, they have to approve any change in the plan. So you're changing benefits and you're changing the uh, premiums. Are they? Sorry. Are they defined benefits? Uh, yeah. <laughs> they, well, they they have a list of benefits. Which must be uh, which and, and limits which they which they actually roll out every year. So what happens? They will tell you when they're selling the product to you that you go to a private hospital. Yeah. You see a specialist. Mm -hmm. You get your first line of drugs mm -hmm. mm -hmm. dispensed. Yeah. And when you actually go to the hospital, then they say, Ah, well, this man got age, This plan has changed. Mm -hmm. You are no longer allowed to stay in the hospital. You have to pay. You have to make a copay. Yeah, of fifteen dollars. But th this was not the case in January. Now we're in July, and, we're mm. and things have changed. No, you see, that's uh, remember I was saying earlier that in Zimbabwe, exactly that um, the regulation is not really robust yet. You know, it's there on the papers. I mean, the <coughs> Medical Services Act, but it's not being enforced properly. That something like that would be frowned upon in South Africa, really, because you can't really go in and change the benefits in the middle of the year without first you know well, without communicating to the members so you go to the hospital and get something some sort of a shock or surprise it's going to create some serious negative impacts for you and it's and to come, you know it's, you, you, you would feel it in the next year when, you move, when people will migrate out of your skin is um, is any of the skins um, well, you know, in South Africa, medical schemes are, should I say, not, uh, they're not for profit you know, in South Africa. So it's basically run on behalf of the members. So it's never, there's no shareholding type thing. Like, well, the shareholders are the members of the scheme. So it is uh, specifically for members. And the members could be a member of an uh, organization, so you can have, you know, you can have like, a group of, uh, they call them closed teams, where the members are members of an uh, employer group. 
or you can have an open scheme which is open to everybody. <coughs> but there's no shareholding. The thing is, this link part is to the medical scheme, so it's actually quite a bit of a kind of administrator's of the scheme as well. Yes, so, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The scheme itself might be not for profit, but uh, the next thing might be, oh, this company that might be a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. and what, what, what's the, what could be the reason? Sorry, for what could be the reason it be in the office? Um, well, it's part of that social solidarity uh, type of uh, arrangement uh, that we have in South Africa where, you know, med you know, medical schemes are supposed to be for and on the other hand, supposed to pay for medical patients for that member. You know, so any sort of surplus you gain must be flowed back into the scheme, either in the form of uh, uh, increased benefits or in of reduced contributions or whatever. But it's always been, I mean, that's been the tenant <coughs> because of the social solidarity. Probably one of the uh, drive towards national health insurance that the uh, government is trying to be able to go with. I don't know if that's going to get that into this, but that is the, uh, that is part of the, I, I believe that's the idea, the kind of. I think it's also in the regulation, you yeah. can't have, you cannot be anything other than a member owns, and that's for the regulation set. But at the moment in South Africa, you can't have anything else. Because yeah. law says this is what you will do, and it's the only way you can do it. Thank you, Gordon. Um, my question relates to the enforcement of regulation. Like we said, uh, if there is a traffic light and no one follows it, then it's as good as that it should not be. Well, with respect to regulation, um, enforcement part of it. I wanted to ask why do you think the Ministry of Health may be interested in enforcing the regulation or why would the Ministry of Finance be interested in enforcing the regulation? Or maybe to ask it another way, um, what would be the impact on medical aid or the health insurance um, if it is regulated by the Ministry of Health or by the Ministry of Finance? And then how can actually help in the decision making is it something that is uh, political the actual is cannot be involved in their skills and making the decision. Mm -hmm. Then lastly, uh, in your vast experience, uh, where is the regulation or which particular of the road is regulation being enforced maybe through the Ministry of Health and others so enforced through the Ministry of Finance and how we pay them paid? I'm trying to remember the whole scene of questions. <laughs> um, I'll take the last one because it's fresh. Um, in Zambia, for instance, I think uh, the Minister of Finance is actually trying to uh, trying to hold all finance based any financial services. They want to hold it under their ambit. And the Ministry of Health is only going to be interested in the national health service. And so if you have like a health insurer, that would be regulated under the Ministry of Finance. But if you have the, but the national health insurance, the government only service, it's going to be regulated by the, uh, uh, by the uh, Ministry of Health. Um, from my experience, most of the time, any health related event, any health related issues are actually done by the Ministry of Health, except South Africa and maybe Vietnam, where there's a bit of a toss up between whether or not the Ministry of Health should be regulating or whether or not the, uh, uh, the Council for Medical Schools. It's a bit of a touchy one, but in terms of um, what, what, what I think of what the regulators might be uh, thinking in terms of why they want to work together, that would be tough. I don't know, but I can imagine that you know they, you know, each each um, stakeholder wants to be wants to feel like they contributed positively to the uh, to the society. Other through the minister, you know, the minister of finance, both of them report to the president, obviously. So each department will be accountable for whatever they decide. So it's important for them to come together so that uh, what, whatever disputes they have, they will, they will sort it out quickly. And of course, there's pressure from the industry to ensure they solve it. Now, what we actually can do is to continue to um, assist the industry in applying that pressure. We can work with the regulator in, in forming policies to ensure that uh, you know this works in the right uh, area. Right now, we have health actuaries and we have life actuaries, both doing health insurance or health work. So the person, you know, there, there's also that uh, interest, you know, everybody's got their own interest uh, to worry about as well. 
So it creates, you know, I'm not sure I have an answer to the question, but uh, I believe that it's important that they work together, and I think they are aware of that. Because they have to answer to a higher authority. Who should we say is actually should regulate him? Should we say it with you know? Yeah, or should we say it with based on this? Yeah. So that we are not caught on the wrong side. <laughs> Uh, I think as an actuary, I'm supposed to be independent, right? <laughs> so so uh, my uh, my feeling is, I, you know, when two elephants are fighting, the grass gets uh, in trouble. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm more concerned about the grass. So I just want everybody to just to solve the issues uh, at this level. If if we're going to have health insurance, then so be it. If we're going to have um, medical schemes, then you know, so be it. Uh, you know, some people will say health insurance in South Africa is more, it's cheaper because if you're a younger person, you can just get a hospital cover. You pay 200 grand or I'm just making a number. <laughs> pay 200 grand rather than going to a medical system and pay 2,000 grand. You know, so, it's, you know, at, at the end of the day, I believe we just need to get it right. But I don't know exactly uh, where to put the uh, Did I answer all your questions? Or have I missed anything? I've got a question on actually somewhat one and a half questions if I can call it. But um, first of all, which country would you say has got a, a perfect mix between health insurance and medical aid schemes? And within that country, what sort of distribution are you looking at um, that would say is sustainable? Because um, like you mentioned that in South Africa you've got quite a number of medical aid schemes. Um, why is it that we don't have that many insurers getting into that field? Why would they just prefer to get money from the administration? Or, yeah, and then first. Um, the question was um, what should be, um, uh, what, uh, at what level would the uh, medical aid? Um, where, where have you seen a Where have I seen some kind of uh, medical aid uh, working, you know, where have I seen it working perfectly with health insurance? With health insurance. Yes, and the distribution within that. My answer is uh, I haven't seen it working. <laughs> uh, that's a short and simple answer. But uh, where I mean, I would say South Africa, as much as there's a lot of um, controversy, the very fact that they're working together to resolve it is actually something plausible. And I believe they're actually one of the better countries in terms of solving this issue. It's still a controversy, but they're resolving it right now in Zambia. The, the, you know, the government just decided, okay, it's going to be. Uh, Health insurance, I mean, it's going to be the Ministry of Health for the NHS, and then that, that's it. You know, so, so, so in that sense, you can say that's working, but we don't know if it's working yet because it's a new event. Uh, but uh, having said that, I think uh, I can't think. Even the US is struggling with their own uh, uh, health uh, system, but at least it's at least it's uh, specifically regulated under the uh, Ministry of Health in the US. So there's, there's we've seen some cases where one, you know, the Ministry of Health. Is the is in charge of cases where the Ministry of Finance is in charge. So when you have this high bridge, you really have problems. And I believe, to answer your question, South Africa is probably my only example of where it's working better than anywhere else. And that's not really reassuring at this stage. The distribution then between the schemes and the health insurance. I don't know the exact numbers, but I can only say medical schemes, I think there's about 8 million members out of 16 million who are on medical scheme in South Africa. I don't know the actual amount of members who are on uh, life insurance or uh, health insurance. I don't even want to help them that. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but for a lot of types of cover, insurance companies are not allowed to provide it. Insurance companies can provide an indemnification benefits yes. for a benefit. So by and large, most health cover really has to make benefits. Mm -hmm. It's just issue around little bits and pieces mm -hmm. where people are finding ways around it. Um, but I mean, the, the other similar sort of example is in the US, where they had obviously very sophisticated uh, <coughs> hospital and, and health providers, mm -hmm. a very much an insurance oriented model, a for profit for insurance company, uh, profit for underwriting model. Uh, and the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is actually a bit of a move towards more of a you can't underwrite, you can't differentiate, mm -hmm. try to have prescribe them with benefits so people don't have these really. Uh, uh, very low benefit schemes. Yeah. So in some ways, I think they recognize that they haven't got it right. Mm. Some of the highest health costs in the world are only kind of okay benefits. 
trying to move slightly more towards a small solidarity based approach, but it does seem to be a good direction. Yeah. And that's a direction actually in a lot of African countries under the uh, Millennium, Millennium Development uh, Funding uh, Principle is to work towards that solidarity based thing. So that's where, and that also creates that controversy because now, oh geez, we want to come up with a national health service, we want to work it out, but then we have this insurance uh, system, so how do we incorporate that? <coughs> The question is, does South Africa have a regulatory stance uh, on pre-existing conditions? Pre-existing conditions. Um, the answer is yes. There are certain, well, um, the way it's structured is that um, you, I think you have a waiting period for a certain list of pre-existing conditions. You know, so um, I, I think pregnancy is not one of them. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, so there's some list of pre-existing conditions where you must have a waiting period of a year or even up to two years. In some cases, if you leave a medical scheme and then you have a gap, then by the time you go back into a medical scheme again, there will be another pre-existing condition requirement that you have to satisfy in order to, uh, to take on benefits. Except for PMD, I think. I mean, PMD is the, you know, except for some, some PMD. Yes, uh, firstly, I don't work in health insurance or medical schemes, so my question might not be as informed. But my question is basically on risk based pricing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know that in your presentation, uh, you highlight that there could be opportunities for actual um, issues with pricing and advising and so on and benefit design. Uh, from your experience uh, in South Africa and other African countries, uh, do we have, these medical schemes have uh, claims that are over a probably reasonable period of time, and do, they, do you find them using that in, in to feed feeding into the pricing, or is that some way of doing the pricing? Because when I look in the Zimbabwe market, I'm not so sure if what I'm currently paying on my is based on the risk that I'm bringing into that medical scheme. Well, in Africa, you have two types of people doing the pricing. You have the actuaries and the farm suckers. <laughs> and uh, the thumb suckers, for some reason, tend to outweigh the actuaries. You know, and that's my experience in Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, and here. South Africa, you know, it's, a, it's well uh, established to that system. So, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, there is claim, there's obviously claims experiences. I mean, the thumb data is also an issue in a lot of markets as well. So it's always difficult. Now, in terms of risk-based pricing, I don't think... Apart from South Africa, I haven't seen any market that actually enforces some kind of solvency requirement. I mean, there's also a requirement here as well, which is similar to the South African uh, um, solvency requirement. But I think it's something that we also really, in my view, I think we need to look at. Because I don't think there's any risk-based analysis in determining what 25% of the contribution is. Right? To me, it sounds like mm -hmm. you just take three months of <laughs> experience and then say, okay, that's it. That's your reserve. So you know, we need to really look at that as something to, and I think that's where the opportunity for actions are, to, uh, to work with the regulators to find a way of adopting a risk-based capital system, like we do in the United States. There's a, there's a formal risk-based capital uh, model that has been used, and you, have, and you need to submit that to the regulators on an annual basis, in addition to your own finance. Okay, uh, I think that to be it for now. Uh, um, any other questions you have, uh, please? Uh, I think I have my emails in there, so you can send me emails. Make sure they nice questions. Thank you so much.